Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. In the last video, I was talking about the idea of thresholds in nonlinear systems. <clears throat> I gave some examples of a tipping canoe, breaking, uh, breaking a stick, um, neurons firing in the human brain, um, whereas a signal will only travel along the, along the neuron if you exceed a threshold voltage, which is the sum of all of the voltages of the input neurons that are connecting at the input. Um, occasionally, um, I've had to cut down some old dead trees um, on a property, and as you cut through the tree and push on the tree, you know, it's very rigid. It doesn't move if it's a big tree. You know, it's probably killed by a uh, uh, mountain pine beetle. Um, that you know the you the, the tree is very rigid and strong but when you cut through you can reach a point where when you push the tree it starts to move a little bit and then come back and it sounds differently and it's a very unstable you know you're reaching a threshold the wood fibers that are holding the tree up are the uh, there, there's no extra it's a minimal amount and then you start to push it a little bit and it starts to deform and doesn't correct so the frequency of oscillation of the movement slows down is a critical slowing down which is a which is a sign basically that you can have a threshold effect and you're going to tip into a different state so if you look at the arctic uh, sea ice um, graphs of how much arctic sea ice there is and you look at it since the satellite record in 1979 you can see very very high frequency fluctuations and then at lately the last number of years there's been large undershoots and overshoots and it's like a critical <coughs> critical slowing down as a threshold is reached and then basically you know no sea ice vanishing sea ice within within a few short years probably so I'm going to uh, delve now into the peer-reviewed paper. It's called Characteristic Disruptions of an Excitable Carbon Cycle by the author is uh, Daniel Rothman. And on my Twitter feed, I basically tweeted out the article in, you know, phys.org, the article about reaching a carbon threshold. Um, clicking on the article, I was discussing the different parameters of it. And basically, the key is that today's oceans are absorbing carbon about an order of magnitude at least 10 times faster than the worst case in the geologic record, which was the end Permian extinction 252 million years ago. You know, people refer to this as time is when life nearly died. Um, so basically, the feedbacks, um, okay, so some of the key findings is when you introduce carbon dioxide at greater rates, once the levels crossed a critical threshold, the carbon cycle re reacted with a cascade of positive feedbacks that magnified the original trigger, causing the entire system to spike in the form of severe ocean acidification. The system then did eventually return to equilibrium after tens of thousands of years. Okay, so, so um, and this is what we've seen in the geologic record. There's a lot of fluctuations in the carbon, which are proportionate to the driving force. But then if you exceed that threshold, the rise of carbon, uh, you know, once you go past the threshold, you give a kick to the system and the system takes over and responds by itself. Okay, um, so, so basically... Um, you know, here, here's a good quote here. We already know that our CO2 emitting actions will have consequences for many millennia, says Tim Lenton. Okay, um, the study suggests, this study suggests these consequences could be much more dramatic than previously expected. If we push the Earth system too far, then it takes over and determines its own response. Past that point, there's very little we can do about it. Okay, so, um, and I showed you um, the previous uh, five extinctions here, okay, um, and, you know, this is how you define the geologic record. So this is the end Orwellian, this is the end Devonian, this is the end Permian, the, the granddaddy of all extinctions, the mother of all extinctions, 
the end triassic a small one and the end cretaceous now talking about about uh, calcium carbonate in the oceans I just want to show you this so we've got Antarctic here and we've got the Arctic here and there's a level here called the calcium the carbonate compensation depth CCD it's the equilibrium between precipitation and dissolution of calcium carbonate so you've got calcium carbonate in the ocean and if you're above this layer the ocean acidity is not sufficient to dissolve the calcium carbonate so it deposits on peaks and things it looks almost like snow on the on the underwater um, uh, volcanoes and and gaiets and so on under the water okay but below this depth um, the calcium carbonate dissolves it's about 4500 meters here and it shallows out it shoals towards both of the poles where the water is more acidic so what happens is, so CO2 in the air combines with water, it forms H2CO3, which is carbonic acid. Then a hydrogen comes off, right? The H plus gives you the acidity and you're left with an HCO3 minus, which is bicarbonate. Another hydrogen comes off, you're left with carbonate CO3 two minus. Okay, um, so this is the idea here so as the oceans get more and more acidic this level here starts to shoal it starts to go to shallower and shallower and shallower water now um, lots of phytoplankton use calcium carbonate in their backbones um, like coccolithophores and uh, things like that there is phytoplankton notably diatoms that use um, silicon dioxide or basically glass as their skeletons one of the key things as the ocean gets more acidic is the backbones of the calcium carbonate uh, phytoplankton reduce and dissolve and dissolve and dissolve so the organism becomes a lot lighter it doesn't have that skeleton so it's less likely to sink to the seafloor bringing that carbon down so that's another um, effect which an amplifying effect if you like so as this level gets shallower and shallower and moves up to the surface, then basically that's uh, a, an extinction type event is caused. Okay, so let's get back into the, the paper. So basically, I'm just going to talk about some of the highlights in this paper. So the history of the carbon cycle is punctuated by these enigmatic transient changes in the ocean store of carbon. Mass extinctions always accompanied by such a disruption, but most disruptions are benign, not causing a mass extinction. Um, but when you do have, a, when you cross this threshold, you get a characteristic rate of change that depends on the system and not on the, um, the rate, not on the nature of the, of the driving force, if you like. So, th so in this paper, a mathematical model was developed to look at the disruptions and the you know what happens when you kick the system when you push the system um, so the magnitude and time scale of the disruption are properties of the carbon cycle itself rather than its perturbation so when you cross a threshold when you you know you're in a steady state you cross a threshold now you're in highly nonlinear state unstable state and the system will change the the in this case the ocean acidification would greatly increase the car calcium carbonate compensation depth would move up to the surface over the whole ocean and you would basically have a, a mass extinction so um, you know in these past um, extinctions the time frame was very very long okay um, and that so the threshold was lower when the um, the rate is very small over long periods of time but you know in this case we're putting carbon into the atmosphere and oceans you know over a period of a hundred you know hundreds you know basically the, since the pre-industrial um, date of 1750 we've been you know really stressing the system over the last uh, 270 years or so um so you know we're and, and we're stressing it a lot harder than than it happened during even this great extinction here the mother of all extinctions 
Okay, so getting back to the uh, paper, um, basically some of the disruptions in the past were, um, were well, there was I, on environmental change, including variations in Earth's orbital parameters. So that cycles between ice age and warm period, dissociation of methane hydrate, bolide impacts, so, so uh, a cosmic impact from an asteroid um, or comet, biogeochemical innovations, changes in chemical weathering, organic carbon burial, volcanic emissions. Okay, there's all of these different mechanisms. So here's an example of the isotopic composition of carbonate, of carbonate carbon, so uh, the heavy carbon basically. So basically we got a huge surge of light carbon which lowered the, the isotopic um, fluctuation right here. And this was 54 million years ago. This is the Eocene thermal maximum. And then there was, that's known as um, uh, uh, the first abrupt downswing is the Eocene thermal maximum two or H1. And then the second event 100,000 years later is H2. This is, this is, um, 100,000 year time scale. So you get an excursion in the isotope so we could see what happened um, in, this, in this time period. So there's a lot of carbon chemistry here. Um, the total dissolved inorganic carbon, DIC, basically it's the CO2. It's CO2 reacts with water forming carbonic acid, H2CO3, and then a hydrogen comes off and you get the bicarbonate another hydrogen comes off and you get the carbonate um, and you get a bunch of hydrogens um, added to the water making it much more acidic. So basically looking at the, a, a, a model was created, an identical model looking at the alkalinity, the dissolved inorganic carbon concentrations and um, a lot of math, differential equations and stuff you know, different st stability states of the system were looked at to developing the model. And this is, a, this is kind of important. So we've got the total dissolved organic carbon here, and we've got the carbonate here across the bottom. Now, this is a stable state here, this black circle here, okay? This is a stable state that you can get locked into. So if you're within this curve here, then basically the parameters fluctuate this way until you reach this stable state. If you're outside the circle, the oval, then basically the fluctuations are this way and they converge to reach the stable state. So it's reached in, in both situations. Um, so, you know, this, is com this comes out of the math. Here we go again here with this type of state. So in this case, this is the um, basically the uh, dissolved inorganic carbon, W, concentration, and you can see it doesn't change that much here, okay, um, if you're below the threshold. But when you, ex when you, go, when you reach the threshold, um, you get this stable state here, and you get this pulse, just like in the, the neuron pulse, okay? Um, so you start at this stable point, you get an unstable occurrence going on, nonlinear change, and you reach another stable state at a much different level. Okay, so, and again, this is a, another situation of, the, of these type of curves which you see in nonlinear dynamical systems. Now, this is important. This is the, um, this is the, the, um, the, this is basically the duration of the event and the amount, the size of the event. So, so basically, these are the five mass extinctions. This is an unstable state here. This is a stable state. Um, and, if, you know, here you see these different um, events. This is N Cretaceous, N Triassic, N Permian is PT. That's the big one. N Dordovicium. Those correspond to these guys here. Okay. So basically, what you see is a curve like this. And we're pushing it just as hard. So comparing us to KT, this is the threshold. So if you've got a long duration pulse, it's low. Here, you know, a couple hundred years, 
here's where we're pushing here. When we cross this curve, we go into nonlinearity. Thanks for listening.